And when it receives light from the Wahi, then there is resonance. And you have Noor on Ala A chance to lead and let them show us how great they can be when they lead as they did in this conference. <laughs> Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya'i wal mursaleen Sayyidana Muhammad wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in Wa ba'd All praises are due to Allah, Lord of the world May Allah always and constantly send peace and blessings to Muhammad To his family, his companions And all those who call to his way 
to the Day of Judgment. As to what follows, I begin with the greeting words of the righteous, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Alhamdulillah, it is a great privilege for me to be with you tonight. And it is very touching, especially for those who lived in Toronto in the 70s. I can recall in the early 70s that there were only two places in Toronto to make Juma. Two places. On Eid al Fitr, the Islamic Foundation in the East End established the Salah and there wasn't enough people to fill the small little foundation. And now by the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are filling the sky dome. Our numbers are increasing and our presence is being felt on all levels within this society. And so we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but at the same time, we must never forget the responsibility upon our shoulders that we are the representatives of the last and greatest prophet who ever lived. There are no more prophets to come. And the innocent people around this world who are accepting Islam are looking toward the Muslims. We are the hope not only for our Ummah, but with us lies the hope for the planet Earth. And so, with this in mind, I want to repeat to you some of what we shared in the beginning of this conference in the day of Jumu'ah. A seven-point plan to initiate Islamic revival. I want to be very practical with you, very straightforward, because the time is short. Number one, we are in need of collective tawbah. Every one of us needs to turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ask for forgiveness and to see within tawbah not only crying to Allah but self-analysis and reconstruction. Number two, working unity amongst believers that the Muslims, especially of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah, that we need to now look to each other for brotherhood and sisterhood. We need to network our strengths. Instead of looking for problems in another Muslim, we should realize the strengths and benefit from the strengths. To network our organizations, there are so many masajid, so many Islamic movements, so many organizations, but alone we are only single individual groups. Together we are a united ummah. And so we need to start looking at other Muslims not for what is wrong or not for what is different than ourselves, but for what is the same. And in most cases, 95% of the other Muslim may be the same and 5% different. And if we focus upon the 5%, then we'll be lost in a confusion of mistrust. Number three, a focus on Muslim families. We need to focus upon real solutions for our families, to set up institutions to defend the weak within our homes. And as I said before, and I say it again, we need to hear the voices of Muslim women, not just in special sessions, but we need to hear the voices of Muslim women in the leadership. Number four, a focus on the youth that we begin to provide halal solutions 
for relevant problems, alternatives in recreation, alternatives in career development, so that our youth are not caught up in the confusion of the 21st century globalization. Number five, awareness of the crises of the Muslim world and active participation in solving these crises. We cannot sit here today and forget about what is happening in Iraq or Philistine or Afghanistan or in Sudan or in any part of the Muslim world. If Muslims are suffering on any part of the planet, then we are all suffering. And we need to keep aware of this. Number six, special emphasis on da'wah, outreach, to take this message to the non-Muslims, to let people who have not heard the beauty of Islam understand where we are coming from. And that those who are accepting Islam, we need to set up institutions so they can come into this faith and realize the true message. And number seven, it is on our backs to provide relevant solutions to real problems in society. We hold the solution to the HIV AIDS crisis. We hold the solution to racism, to economic exploitation, to polytheism, to atheism, and to sexual perversion. And we need to see that it is our responsibility to take this message to all of the homes of people who have not heard Kalima la ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah alayhi salatu wa Brothers and sisters, the world we are living in today is going through tremendous changes and technology has given us the ability to, to funnel information around the planet, but with the ability to teach all around the world simultaneously, we also have the ability to confuse each other simultaneously. And so, it is crucial for the younger generation to begin to go to the original sources of Islam, to study hard in the Arabic language. Go to those sources so you can know if somebody is teaching you Islam or something else. The younger generation also needs to read widely. Don't accept everything that is being taught to you in the university. Question your teachers. Question the television. Question the media. Go to your own sources and travel in the land. Because with travel, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up our eyes. We are in desperate need of hikmah, of wisdom. Putting things in the proper perspective. In many cases, it's not what we know, it's not how many verses we've memorized or ahadith, but it is how we are using it. And so we need perspective. One of the great areas of perspective is history. A people without a history who have no memory of themselves have no direction for the future. And so it is crucial for us <coughs> to take out of this conference the legacy of Muslims around this planet. As a young African-American growing up in North America, I realized that history was a crucial subject and I questioned my teacher from the early days because they showed us a picture of Christopher Columbus and you may have heard this in your own schools, he's landing on the shores and they say Christopher Columbus discovered America in 1492. I question people in Africa and Asia. I asked them who discovered America and they said Christopher Columbus. 
in 1492. But when you look to the picture of Columbus, he lands on the shores and the native people are standing there looking at him. So the question I asked as a young person was, how can you discover a place when the people have lived there for over 10,000 years? So we need to be able to deconstruct our history, deconstruct information being given to us, put it in a proper perspective, and then rewrite our own history. If I had the power, I would write, Christopher Columbus was discovered in 1492. He bumped into America. He bumped into America thinking he was going to India and called the people Indians. And when he returned to Spain, he couldn't properly describe where he had been. But yet, until only recently, it was considered to be a fact. This is cultural and educational imperialism. And it is crucial for Muslims to begin to look at our history, to go into our own roots, and to understand where we are coming from. We are being bombarded with negative images of Islam. We are being bombarded with misinformation and they are still talking about Darfur. And they're talking about the light-skinned Arabs coming down, destroying the dark-skinned Africans. The same way they lied about the Sudan, they, are, they lied about Islam. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect the Sudan and to give them strength, and to give them an Islamic state. I want to share with you a few gems that over the years Allah has blessed me to find concerning the African continent. Because it has been so misunderstood, the legacy of Africa has been so misunderstood, and Muslims need to understand that we are not separate races, we are not separate countries, but we are all part of the Ummah of Muhammad And so, when we look at Africa, we don't find a country where an imperial army is entering into the continent. The first message of Islam, in Surah An-Nahl verse 36, Allah has revealed to us, وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةٍ رَسُولًا أَنِعْبُدُ اللَّهَ وَاجْتَنِبُ التَّغُوتِ فَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ هَدَى اللَّهُ وَمِنْهُمْ مَنْ حَقَّتْ عَلَيْهِ الضَّلَالَةِ فَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ فَانْظُرُوا كَيْفَ كَانَ عَاقِبَةُ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ And we certainly sent into every nation a messenger, saying, Worship Allah and avoid false deities. Of the people were some who Allah guided, and of them were those upon whom error was decreed. So travel in, travel through the earth, and see what was the end of those who denied truth. And so in traveling to different African nations, we are finding an amazing phenomenon. In every nation, there is a strong belief in one God. وَلَقَدْ بَعَثْنَا فِي كُلِّ أُمَّةِ In every nation, there were people who taught the belief in one God. Even in ancient Egypt, people think that the Fir'aun of the time of Musa السلام, represents all of the Fara'ina. This is not true. In Egypt, in all parts of Africa and the world, at one point in time, they, or at some point in time, there were people sent to give them the message. And so monotheism has taken root in the continent thousands of years ago. The time of the Prophet Muhammad 
the last messenger, peace be upon him, in the time of persecution, in the time when the Meccans refused to accept this message, the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent his followers to Habasha. This is the first Hijrah, the fifth year of the Prophethood. The Prophet Sallallahu when he described this to his followers, he told them, if you go to Al-Habasha, to Abyssinia, it would be better for you, for in it there is a king who will not tolerate oppression. Fiha malikun la yudlamu indahu ahad. Nobody is oppressed with him. Wahiya ardu sidqin. It is a land of truth. Go until such time as Allah shall relieve you from your distress. How did the Prophet, peace be upon him, know that it was a land of truth? What was the relationship between Rasulullah and Ashama and Najashis? Rahimahullah wa radiallahu anhu, an individual that we need to study. And those who want to begin to understand our heroes, we need to go into our history. There are so many thousands of heroes throughout the world. The younger generation is being bombarded with sports. And so our heroes become Ronaldo, Rivaldo, Ronaldinho, and Figo, and who scored the goal, and whatever. And we love soccer. But if soccer, if one, if a grown man kicking a ball in the net is more important than children dying in Philistine, then something is wrong. And so the Prophet, peace be upon him, sent his followers to Abyssinia. And he sent a letter with his followers, an interesting letter that was different than any other letter he sent to a, to a, a king. He said, in the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, from Muhammad, the Messenger of Allah, to the great Nagus Najashi of Abyssinia, peace be upon he who follows the guidance as to what follows. Verily for you I praise Allah, the one whom there is no deity except him, the sole king, the holy, the source of peace, the protector and the guardian. I bear witness that Jesus the son of Mary is the spirit belonging to Allah and his word which he cast into the chaste and excellent virgin Mary. She thus became pregnant by means of his spirit and his inspiration with Jesus in the same manner that he created Adam with his hand. Verily I invite you to Allah, the one who has no partner, and to friendship, continuity, and government in obedience to him. Thus I have delivered the message and given you counsel, therefore accept my counsel, peace be upon he who follows the guidance. I invite you to follow me and to have absolute certainty with what I have come with. Verily I am the messenger of Allah and I invite you and your government forces to Allah the mighty, the majestic. Just two weeks ago, Allah blessed us to go high in the mountains of northern Ethiopia. And we found a village where lies Najashi. This that you see on the screen is Masjid and Najashi. It is the site of the great king who accepted Islam, who struggled with his people, and who set an example for generations to come. And it is with that spirit that we turn history around. Africa was not a place where an imperial army attacked. Muslims sought refuge in Africa and received sanctuary. Ashama Rahimahullah recognized the Prophet Sallallahu And the scholars show us through the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu prayed janazah for him 
He was Muslim. This is a picture of where his grave lies. It is said over 20 of the Sahaba, radiallahu anhum, are laying with him. We entered this area two weeks ago. What a beautiful smell. I said to, to the, to the Hadith, to the God, what is that smell? Are you putting perfume? He said, yes, a little bit, but something is coming up from this place. It is a land of truth. And it is a land that we need to investigate to understand more about the legacy of Islam. In the northern areas, in 642, Egypt became the first northern bridgehead for the Muslims. We have to understand that the confrontation that went on in the north was not a religious confrontation. It was Muslims responding to the imperialism of the Byzantine Romans. And so, with a relatively small force and supported by Coptic Christians, the Muslims defeated the Byzantines and entered into the area. Later on, Uqba ibn Nafi' radiallahu an, established Qaydawan. He rode his horse all the way to the Atlantic. He looked across the Atlantic and said, if I knew there was land across you, I would take this message across. Uqba also went south and reached somewhere in the area of Lake Chad. And so Islam was then spreading, not by imperial force, but by the contact. In 705, Hassan ibn Nu'man founded an area known as Ifriqiyah. Many of us don't understand that the word Africa comes from the Arabic language. It's Ifriqiyah. We're shocked when we find how deep the legacy of Arabic and Islam is in this world. But a key point to remember is that the spread of Islam in Africa was independent of the military confrontations and as a result of migration, trade, and the wandering of scholars and holy men. It was done through contact, through akhlaq, through the character. And that is what our scholars are talking about. We need to take this legacy of Islam and through our character, show the people of Canada that Islam is not a religion of terrorism, but it is the religion of peace, and it is the solution to the world crises today. We also need to remember that the non-Arab people who came into contact with Islam became familiar with Arabic, Arabic became a lingua franca. It became the language of religion and trade and scholarship. Even local languages throughout Africa were written in the Ajami script, the Arabic script. And we still have documentation today, which is coming up all over the continent, that is written with Arabic script. And seeing the Muslims crossing the north, we find in 734, the governor of Ifriqiya sends trade missions to the south. They found large quantities of gold. It was the highest concentration of gold on earth at the time. Wells were dug along the roots, and Muslims crossed the Sahara, the Great Sahara Desert. It's a beautiful history to study. And if you get the chance to travel in this region, travel and look at our heritage, taste what our forefathers have tasted. And looking at the trade routes, one of the main trade routes was Tripoli, Gadamas, Bilma, and Kanem Bornu. A second route was Tahir, Tadmecca, and Gao. A third route was Fez, Sijilmasa, Odegas and Kumbisale. What is the importance of these trade routes? The Sanhaja Berbers, one of the main inspired groups, protected 
the ulama took this message, took it into their lives, and carried it across the desert. And so we find Islam traveling across to West Africa in the early times. By the 9th and 10th century, Muslim merchants established their quarters in West Africa. And I want to share with you something from our legacy. We study our history, we study our lands, and we can learn for our own lives. The Andalusian geographer Az-Zuhri, in 1068, he brought valuable information about three African Muslim empires. Ancient Ghana, which was first known, it was the first known political state of the Western Sudan, founded by the Kaya Maga Mende people in the fourth century, it was, but later it was ruled by the Soninke people. The capital of Ghana included a Muslim town and a royal town. So the two groups lived in separate quarters. This allowed each group to maintain and practice different religious rites that may be offensive to the other group. So what develops is that Muslims are living under a non-Muslim ruler, they benefit the government, and the government benefits them, and they live in peace. This is a model for Muslims living as a minority group. The second model is Gao. This, in this model, the king of Gao was Muslim, and the royal emblem was Islamic, but the masses of the people still worship idols and other pre-Islamic customs existed. So the king was an imam during the day and a magician, sahir, at night. He was trying to get the best of the both worlds. He makes dua and puts a spell on you. That's another uh, uh, form, a trend, that comes with the spreading of Islam. The third is takroor. In takroor, the Wolof Berber state, it was won over completely to Islam. A total wiping out of all other different forms of faith. Complete Amrul bil Maruf wa Nahyan Munka. That is another model of Islam. My recommendation for us is the first one. That we can live within this society. We need to establish our communities, establish our lifestyle, benefit the society and the society uh, and we can, we can also benefit from living in this part of the world. Al-Murabitun Al-Murabitun established themselves and carry the message across the desert. What is important about this is that they blame the Murabitun for destroying Ghana, but there is no solid evidence about any conquest. Then we go on, and I'll have to go a little faster because of time. Islam reached the Mandinka in the 11th century. But in the 13th century, the king of Mali accepted Islam. Following this, a number of great kings, Mansa Uli, who made pilgrimage to Mecca, and expanded Mali. Mansa Suleiman, who built masjids and ex 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 strengthened Islamic culture. Ibn Battuta, the great traveler, visited Mali during his reign. And Mansa Musa, as we heard uh, Dr. Umar speak about earlier, he made pilgrimage to Mecca in 1324. In some reports, he carried between 65 to 72,000 people across the Sahara Desert. And so Mansa Musa returned and he built up the cities, helped to establish the city of Timbuktu, which people know today as somewhere out on the planet Mars. But Timbuktu was a center of knowledge to the point where at one point in Timbuktu in Jenne, 25 thousand students were studying Islam. The most valuable item in the society 
was a book. From there, a succession of Islamic states built on literacy and education, nation builders, scholars, statesmen are developed throughout the continent. Now we take a brief look at Islam in East Africa. And here we find that from the early times, there was a connection between the Arabs on the Red Sea and the people of East Africa. Trade had gone on for hundreds of years with spices. Islam re-entered the Horn of Africa during the Umayyad period. In the 7th and 8th century, Muslims, merchants, Ashraf, people from the family of the Prophet ﷺ, crossed over and settled in the islands of Dahlak, Suwakin, and Zayla, and Islam was established in this region. The walled city of Hara, that many of us have no knowledge of, by the 16th century became a mysterious city called Medinatul Awliya, Medinatul Ulama. And it wasn't until the 19th century that a non-Muslim even entered the city, a well-kept secret. Islam continued to spread. Swahili culture was developed. Sawahil, the coastline. Swahili culture is a beautiful blending of Bantu African culture, Arab culture, Persian culture. It is the people who live along the coastlines. And it is a beautiful co coming together of the cultures of Africa and Asia. We also find powerful city-states developing. The city of Kilwa, when the Portuguese turned around the bottom of Africa, they found a major city larger than anything in Portugal. But what did they do? They destroyed it and tried to colonize the coastline, destroying the whole side of Africa. Muslims responded to this. Later on, from Oman, Muslims entered the region and they defeated the Portuguese, but unfortunately they became slave traders themselves. And that is something that we need to understand about our history. But the founding of Swahili culture is not slavery. It is a blending of the different cultures within Islam. As we heard earlier, over 30% in many uh, opinions of scholars, as many as 30% of African slaves and political prisoners in the Western Hemisphere were Muslims. I want to just, in conclusion, share with you something from uh, the annals of the people in slavery. Some of the names were mentioned earlier by Dr. Umar, Ayub ibn Sulaiman, Ibrahim Abdurrahman, Yaro Mahmud, Muhammad Sane, Umar bin Sayyid, Muhammadu Bilali, Saleh Bilali, Benjamin Cochran, and we continue to go on. What is crucial for us in terms of legacy, and I want to share with you the actual pictures. You see the picture of Ayub ibn Suleiman, Rahimahullah, who was born in Gambia in the 1700s, enslaved in Maryland. He wrote the whole Quran from memory. This is his writing, found in America. We also remember Abdurrahman ibn Ibrahim of Guinea. This is his writings, the Arabic language, found in America. We also remember Yaro Mahmud, born in the 1700s, died at the age of 128. He was freed after 70 years in slavery. Umar bin Sayyid, who wrote his own biography in Arabic, when his slave master came and said, I want you to write the Lord's Prayer in Arabic. And he said, yes, I will, thank you. And he said, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahir Rabbil Alameen, 
Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, and he wrote the Fatiha. And so we dedicate this presentation to those who have suffered and those who now, from their dua and from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, their children are raising up and accepting Islam. In conclusion, cultural continuity, the Arabic language, look on the screen and you will see on one side the letter written to Najashi. On the other side, this is a letter which is written by the slaves in Brazil. In 1835, a slave revolt in Brazil, the Muslims opened up the territory and governed their region according to Sharia. The legacy continues. Who is that man in the middle of the screen? You usually see him with a bow tie and a suit. This is Malcolm X, Al-Hajj Malik Shabazz. He is wearing the clothes of the ulama. What does he have in his hand? He has the Qur'an. He has a book. And so in conclusion, our legacy to the world, Tawheed, we have monotheism, we have unity for this world, Tahara, purity of mind, body, environment, and sexual relationships, and Al-Amrul Bil Maruf and Nahi Al Munka, calling to righteousness and forbidding evil. In conclusion, I want to leave you, because so many people are asking me, with two points. Number one, that Alhamdulillah, our brother Ahmed Didat is alive and well. Allah has blessed him, even though his body is paralyzed. He can only move his eyes. He is still debating. He is writing a book right now. And the second and final point, one of our dear brothers, Imam Jamil Al-Amin, who was arrested and wrongfully put into jail. A representative is here today. We are hearing now, coming from the jail cells, he is under 23-hour lockdown. But his spirit is high. He is still giving dawah even by writing paper. And some of the people around him, even the gods, are becoming Muslim. Recently, <laughs> recently, they sent a member of the Aryan nation, a bald headed skinhead racist into his cell, a killer from the Aryan nation. And they put him in Imam Jamil's cell, hoping he would destroy the Imam. When they brought this right-wing skinhead out of the cell, after a few days, the man said, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu So the legacy continues. This is a message for us, that those who are even locked down, who are paralyzed amongst us, are still striving in this path. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all the strength to strive in this path. May Allah forgive us for what we have done, for not holding up this message. And may Allah accept everyone here today, that our last words would be kalima la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, عليه الصلاة والسلام أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم كل يا أهل الكتاب تعالوا إلى قلمة سواء بين بينكم ألا نعبد إلا الله ولا نشرك به شيئا 
ولا يتخذ بعضنا بعضا اربابا من الله فان تولوا فقولوا اشهدوا بان مسلمون رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري وهل الاقدة من لساني يفقه قولي my special elders and my dear brothers and sisters i welcome all of you with the islamic greetings assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh May peace, mercy, and blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala be on all of you. You may be wondering that, why do I require a separate microphone, why not the podium? As the person who inspired me, Sheikh Ahmad Didad, who Sheikh Abdul Hakim quick just spoke about, even he prefers this type of microphone, so that a person can see the body language. Not that I have a very good physique, But when a person gives a talk, the matter he speaks, according to research, it carries only 7% marks. The 93% is the presentation skills. How do you modulate your voice, the gestures, the eye-to-eye -eye contact, and the body language. Therefore, I request the organizers if they can increase the lighting in the audience. Normally, in dramas and rock shows, you have a blackout in the audience. When a lecture is given, I would like to interact with the audience. I would like to see whether the chairs are filled or empty. Inshallah, shukran. In Bombay, we specialize in how to teach about public speaking, how to interact, how to speak with your eyes, how to speak with your hands. So that's the reason I prefer there is light in the audience. This is not a drama or a rock show. The topic of my talk today is similarities between the teachings of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him and the other Abrahamic prophets or in other words similarities between Islam Christianity and Judaism on the first day of the convention I had spoken regarding the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the world scriptures and also spoke about the prophecy of Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him in Judaism as well as in Christianity. And I mentioned that the Quran says in Surah Fatih, chapter number 35, verse number 24, wa min illa khalafi an -nazir. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner. By name, only 25 messengers are mentioned in the Quran. But the beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said there were 124,000 messengers sent on the face of the earth. But by name, only 25 are mentioned in the Quran. For example, Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. And Islam is the only non-Christian faith which makes it an article of faith to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. No Muslim is a Muslim if he does not believe in Jesus, peace be upon him. We believe that he was one of the mightiest messengers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We believe that he was the Messiah, translated Christ. We believe that he was born miraculously without any male intervention, which many modern day Christians today do not believe. We believe that he gave life to the dead with God's permission. We believe that he healed those born blind and lepers with God's permission. But all the messengers that came before, the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, they were only meant for their people and the message they brought was meant to be followed only till a particular time period. And Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him, since he was the last and final messenger, he was not sent only for the Muslims or the Arabs, he was sent for the whole of humanity. Similarly, Allah says in the Quran in Surah Rod, chapter number 13, verse number 38, In every age have we sent a revelation, have we revealed a book. By name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. Torah, Zabur, Injil, and the Quran. All the revelations that came before the glorious Quran, they were meant only for a particular group of people and the message was meant to be followed in totality only till a particular time period. But the last and final revelation of the glorious Quran 
was not meant only for the Muslims or the Arabs, it was meant for the whole of humanity. As Allah mentions in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse number 1, in Surah Ibrahim, chapter number 14, verse 54, in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse 185, as well as in Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse number 41, that the Quran was revealed for the whole of humankind. Let us today discuss what are the similarities between Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, it's mentioned in Sahih Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Iman, Hadith number eight, the beloved Prophet said, our religion of Islam is based on five principles, on five pillars. The first is, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. The second is, Akhim salat Third is, to pay zakat. Fourth is, Hajj. And fifth is, Psalm. Let's discuss the similarities between the pillars of Islam and Judaism and Christianity. The first is, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. There is no God but Allah and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is the messenger of Allah. This was discussed by me on the first day that Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in all the major world religious scriptures, including the scriptures of Judaism and Christianity. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 177, It is not righteousness that you turn your face to the east or west, but it is righteousness that you believe in Allah, that you believe in the last day, that you believe in His angels, His books, and His messengers. I started my talk by quoting a verse from the glorious Quran, from Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Kul, ya hilal kitab, say, O people of the book, ta'alaw ila kalmitin sawa im bayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, na'buda illallah. That we worship none but one Allah. Wala nushrika bihi shayyaw. That we associate with partners with him. Wala yattakhi zabad dun abad dun araban min dun illa. That we erect not among ourselves lords and patrons other than Allah. Fain tawallahu. If then they turn back. Fakulu shadu. Say he be witness. We are not Muslimun, that we are Muslims vowing our will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This verse which I call as the master key for doing da'wah says, Ta'ala ila kalmitin sawa in banana baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Regarding the concept of God in Islam, the best reply any Muslim can give you is quote to you for a class, chapter number 112, verse number 1 to 4, which says, Kul hu Allahu ahad. Say he is Allah one and only. Allah has samad. Allah the absolute and eternal. Lam yalid wa lam yulad. He begets not, nor is begotten. Wa lam yakullahu kufu wa ahad. There is nothing like him. This is a four line definition of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of Almighty God, given in the glorious Quran, which is the litmus test, the touchstone of theology. A similar message is given in the Jewish scriptures. It's mentioned in the Old Testament, in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 6, verse number 4. Moses, peace be upon him, says in Hebrew, Shama Israelo, Adnal Hainu Adnaikhad. Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. And when Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was asked, that which is the first of the commandment, he repeated verbatim what was said by Moses, peace be upon him, earlier. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 12. Verse number 29, and Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said, Shema Israelo, Adnel Hainu Abnaikhad. It's a Hebrew quotation which means, Yoro Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 48, and Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 116, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will never forgive the sin of shirk, associating partners with God, joining partners with God. Any other sin, if he wishes, if he pleases, he may forgive. But the sin of shirk, he will never forgive because it is the most heinous sin. A similar message is given in the Bible. It's mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 20, verse number 3 to 5. 
it says almighty god says thou shall have no other god besides me thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of anything of any likeness in the heaven above in the earth beneath and the water under the earth thou shall not bow down to them nor serve them for i thy god thy lord is a jealous god the same message is repeated in the book of deuteronomy chapter number 5 verse number 7 and 9 the god says thou shall have none other god besides me thou shall not make unto thee any graven image of anything of any likeness in the heaven above in the earth beneath and the water beneath the earth thou shall not bow down to them nor serve them for i thy god thy lord is a jealous god associating partners with god is the biggest sin but unfortunately many of our christian brothers and sisters they say that jesus christ peace be upon him he claimed divinity the quran says in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 72 it says they are in kufr wa laqad kafar alladhina qalu inna allah hu sabni marima they are in kufr those who say that jesus christ the son of mary is allah wa qala al masih but said christ ya bani israil ocean of israel uqbudullah worship allah rabbi wa rabbakum who is my lord and your lord inna ma yushrik billah anyone who associate partner with allah faqad harrama allah alayhi janna allah will make jannat haram for him wa ma bahun nar wa ma lil zalimi min ansar and fire shall be his dwelling place and he shall have no helpers in the hereafter jesus christ peace be upon him said inna ma yushrik billah anyone who associate partner with allah faqad harrama allah alayhi janna allah will make jannat haram for him wa ma bahun nar Mamal zalimin ansar and fire shall be his dwelling place and he shall have no help us in the hereafter if you read the bible our christian brothers and sisters they say that jesus christ peace be upon him he claimed divinity but there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete bible where jesus christ peace be upon him himself says that i am god or will you worship me i would like to repeat that there is not a single unequivocal statement in the complete bible not a single unambiguous statement in the complete bible where jesus christ peace be upon him himself says that i am god or why should worship me if anyone can point me such a statement in the bible i dr zakir naik i am ready to accept krishnaji today i am not speaking on behalf of my other muslim brothers i am a student of comparative religion i study the bible and the other sacred scriptures in fact if you read the bible jesus christ peace be upon him himself said it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 14 verse number 28 jesus christ peace be upon him said my father is greater than i gospel of john chapter number 10 verse number 29 my father is greater than all gospel of matthew chapter number 12 verse number 28 i cast out devil with the spirit of god Gospel of Luke chapter number 11 verse number 20 I with the finger of God I cast out devil Gospel of John chapter number 5 verse number 30 I can of my own self do nothing as I hear I judge and my judgment is just for I seek not my will but the will of my father anyone who says I seek not my will but the will of almighty God he is a muslim Jesus Christ peace be upon him is a muslim It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew chapter number 5 verse number 7 to 20 jesus christ peace be upon him says think not that i am come to destroy the law of the prophets i have come not to destroy but to fulfill until the heaven and the earth pass away not one jot or tittle shall pass away from the law until all be fulfilled and whosoever shall keep the commandments and teach men to do so shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven and whosoever shall break one of the least commandments he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and the pharisees in no way shall you enter the kingdom of heaven if you want to go to jannah according to jesus christ peace be upon him you have to keep all the laws and commandments which was given by moses peace be upon him and which is mentioned in the jewish jesus christ peace be upon him he never claimed divinity in fact it's mentioned in the gospel of john chapter number 14 verse number 24 jesus christ peace be upon him says that 
the words that you hear are not mine, but my Father's who has sent me. It's mentioned in the Gospel of John, chapter number 17, verse number 3. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, This is life eternal, so that you may know there is one God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 19, verse number 16 to 18, that a person approaches Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, and tells him, Good master, what good things should I do so that I shall enter eternal life, so that I shall go to Jannah? So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says that why thou callest me good? Leave aside God. He says, why thou callest me good? There's only one good, and that is the Father in heaven. That's Almighty God. And if you want to enter eternal life, you should keep the commandments. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, did not say that you have to believe I am God if you want to go to Jannah. He never said that you have to believe that I died on the cross for your sins if you want to go to Jannah. He said, if you want to go to Jannah, you keep the commandments. And it's clearly mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 2, verse number 22. It says, E men of Israel, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him amongst you and you are witness to it. It says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God amongst you by wonders and miracles which God did by him amidst you and you are witness to it. Shirk is the biggest sin in Islam, in Judaism as well as Christianity. It's the biggest sin. As far as calling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala by different names, Allah says in Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 110, Qulidullah Abidur Rahman, Ayama Tadu, Falal Asma Husna. Say call upon him by Allah or by Rahman. By whichever name you call upon him, to him belongs the most beautiful name. There are no less than 99 different attributes given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious Quran. You can call him by any name, but it should be a beautiful name. It should not conjure up a mental picture. For example, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, Al-Hakim, most merciful, most beneficent, most wise. No less than 99 names are given in the Quran to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the crowning one is Allah. Why do we Muslims prefer calling Allah by the Arabic name Allah instead of the English word God? The reason is because a person can play mischief with the English word God. For example, if you add S to God, it becomes God's. That is plural of God. There's nothing like plural Allah. Kul hu Allah ahad. Say he's Allah one and only. If you add D-E-S-S -S to God, it becomes Goddess, meaning a female God. There's nothing like female Allah or male Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is unique. If you add a father to God, it becomes Godfather. He's my Godfather. He's my guardian. There's nothing like Allah father or Allah Abba in Islam. If you add a mother to God, it becomes Godmother. There's nothing like Allah mother or Allah Ami in Islam. If you prefix a tin before God, it becomes tin God, meaning a fake God. There's nothing like tin Allah in Islam. That's the reason I say that we Muslims, we prefer calling Allah by the Arabic word Allah instead of the English word God. But when a Muslim is speaking to non-Muslims who may not understand the concept of Allah, and if someone uses the word God like the way I am doing, and other speakers are doing, I have got no objection. Because people may not know the concept of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But I would like to remind them that God is not the appropriate translation for that Arabic word Allah. And this word Allah is mentioned in all the major scriptures of the world. Hindu scriptures, Sikh scriptures, including Jewish and the Christian scriptures. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 15, verse number 34, as well as the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 27, verse number 46, when Jesus Christ peace be upon him, when he was put on the cross, he cried out, Allah, Allah, lama sabakhtani, so as to say, O oh God, O oh God, why hast thou forsaken me? And this Allah, Allah, lama sabakhtani, is the exact word spoken by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. And we know Jesus, peace be upon him, he spoke Hebrew, he spoke Aramaic, which is the sister language of Arabic. 
Allah, Allah lama sabak tani does not sound like oh God, oh God, why has thou forsaken me? Allah, Allah lama sabak tani doesn't sound like Jehovah, Jehovah, why has thou forsaken me? But if you translate into Arabic, Allah, Allah lama sabak tani, it is Allah, Allah lama tarak tani. Arabic and Hebrew and Aramaic are sister languages. And if you refer to the Scofield's Bible, it says A-L-A-H, it means God. They spell Allah as A-L-A-H, we spell it A-L-L-A-H. It is somewhat similar, Allah. And this word Allah, you will find in all the different translations of the Bible. The Bible, the Old, the New Testament has been translated into more than 2,000 different languages. But in every translation, the original words of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, where he used the word Allah, Almighty God, is maintained in all the translations, whether it be French, English, German, Spanish, Hindi, Urdu, Marathi, in all the translations, the words Allah, Allah, Lama, Sabakhtani has been maintained. This is the proper noun for Almighty God. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second pillar of Islam is Akhim salat And people translate salah as prayer. To pray means to beseech, to ask for help. And in our salah, we don't only ask for help. Besides asking for help, we praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we even get guidance from Him. That's the reason I prefer calling it a programming towards righteousness. And I've given a talk on this subject, Salah, the program into righteousness. But if someone uses the translation for Salah as prayer, I don't mind because if someone asks you where are you going, and if you say I'm going for programming, I'm going for brainwashing, it sounds a bit odd. So if you use the word prayer for translation of Salah, I've got no objection. But again, the English word prayer does not denote the complete meaning of the Arabic word Salah. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Kabut, chapter number 29, verse number 45, it says that we have revealed to you the revelation by inspiration and established regular salah. Verily, salah restrains you from shameful and unjust deeds. Salah restrains you from shameful and unjust And we have to offer Salah minimum five times a day. It's given in the Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 130, as well as Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 78. And before we offer Salah, we usually remove our footwear. This was the commandment given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Prophet Moses, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Quran in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, Verse number 11, that he heard a voice. O oh Moses, verily I am your Lord. Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for thou art in the sacred valley of Tuwa. The same message is given in the book of Exodus. Chapter number 3, verse number 5, it says that Almighty God says to Moses, peace be upon him, Draw not na hither, put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy grounds. This message is also repeated in the book of Acts, chapter number 7, verse number 33, where God says to Moses, Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. So because it's a commandment to Moses, peace be upon him, we Muslims, we normally remove our shoes before we offer salah. But according to a hadith, a say hadith in Abu Dawud, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 240, hadith number 653, Amr bin Shweb, may Allah be pleased with him, on the authority of his father, he said that his grandfather told him that he saw the Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, pray Salah with shoes as well as without shoes. So we can offer Salah with shoes also without shoes, but normally in the mosque we remove our shoes. It is a commandment given to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to Moses. Before Salah, we have to do ablution, wudu. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 6, that, Ya ayyuhal ladhin amunu, 
or you believe, then you prepare yourself for salah, wash your hands and your face and your hands up to the elbow, rub your head with water and wash your feet up to the ankle. Wudu is compulsory before offering salah. This was the guidance even given to the earlier prophets. It's mentioned in the book of Exodus, chapter number 40, verse number 31 and 32, that Moses and Aaron, they washed the hands and feet before they appeared in front of the Lord. A similar message is given in the book of Acts, chapter number 21, verse number 26, that Paul, along with the other men, he washed before he appeared in front of the Lord. So wudu is compulsory before Salah. It's not only for the Muslims, but even for the Jews and the Christians. It is sort of a mental preparation before you appear in front of your Lord. When we offer Salah, our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari, volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 75, hadith number 692. Hazrat Anas Manlah repeated and said, that when we stood for Salah, our shoulders touched the shoulders of the companions, our feet touched the feet of the companions. The beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi said, it's mentioned in the Sahih Hadith of Sunnah Abu Dawud, volume number one, in the book of Salah, chapter number 245, hadith number 666, that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam before offering Salah, he said, stay in your rows, stand shoulder to shoulder, close in the gaps, do not leave any space for the Satan, for the devil. The Prophet wasn't talking about the devil, which you see in the museum with two horns and a tail. The Prophet was talking about the devil of racism, of caste, of color, irrespective of whether rich or poor. When you stand for Salah, you stand shoulder to shoulder. That irrespective of whether rich or poor, whether king or pauper, whether white or black, whether yellow or brown. When we stand for Salah, we stand shoulder to shoulder. We practically demonstrate universal brotherhood minimum five times every day. And the best part of Salah is the sujood. No wonder it is mentioned in the Quran no less than 92 times. It's also mentioned in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 43, where Allah says, Ya Maria Mukliti li Rabbiki Vasjudi Warkai Mar Rakhin. O Mary, worship thy Lord devotedly. Bow down and prostrate yourself. And bow down with those who bow down. Allah repeats the message in Surah Hajj, chapter number 22, verse number 77. That, Ya Lizin Amnu, O you believe. Bow down and prostrate yourself. And adore the Lord, so that you will be prosperous. And sujood was the way of offering salah of all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, including the biblical prophets, the prophets of Judaism and the prophets of Christianity. If you read the Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter number 17, verse number 3, Abraham, peace be upon him, he fell on his face and he prayed to God. It's mentioned in the book of Numbers, chapter number 20, verse number 6. Moses, peace be upon him, and Aaron, peace be upon him, they fell on their face. It's mentioned in the book of Joshua, chapter number 5, verse number 14, that Joshua fell on his face and he prayed to God. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 26, verse number 39, that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, in the garden of Gethsemane, he fell on his face and the Lord appeared in front of him. So all the prophets of God, when they offered Salah, they did the sujood, they did prostration. The third pillar is zakat. That's every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, more than 85 grams of gold, should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year. If every rich human being gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. The Quran says in Surah Hashar chapter 59, Verse number seven, that zakat has been prescribed so that the wealth does not circulate only amongst the rich. And the same is mentioned in the Bible. If you read the book of Peter's, the first book of Peter's, chapter number four, verse number eight, it says, give fervent charity because it covers up multitudes of sin. Giving charity is advised in the Bible. So the Jews as well as the Christians. The third pillar is 
Hajj. That is, every adult Muslim who has the means should perform Hajj. That is, pilgrimage to the city of Makkah at least once in his lifetime during the month of Hajj. It is the biggest annual gathering in the world where two and a half million people from different parts of the world, from USA, from Canada, from UK, from Singapore, Malaysia, India, Pakistan, they come to Makkah and the men that are dressed up in two pieces of unfound cloth, which is white, you cannot identify the person standing next to you, whether the king or a pauper. We come at the same call, Labbaik, Allahumma Labbaik, here we are, oh my Lord, here we are at your service. The pilgrimage to Makkah is even prescribed in the Bible, which many of the Muslims, neither the Christians are aware. It's mentioned in the book of Psalms, chapter number 84, verse number 4 to 7, that blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Bakkah. Bakkah is another name for Makkah in the Quran, it is Surah Al-Imran, chapter 3, verse 96. So the Bible also says that blessed are those people who travel to the valley of Makkah. The fourth pillar is psalm, that is fasting, abstaining from drinking, eating and sex from dawn to sunset. And the Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 183, that fasting has been prescribed to you as it was prescribed to people who come before you, so that you may learn self-restraint. Today the psychologists say that if you can control your hunger, you can control almost all your desires. And there are various medical benefits of fasting. You can give a talk on that. Time doesn't permit me. It increases intestinal absorption. It lowers the cholesterol level. It prevents you from doing many evil things, etc. That's the reason even in the Bible, fasting has been prescribed. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Mark, chapter number 9, verse number 29. And the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 17, verse number 21, that fasting has been advised has been prescribed. This was in brief the five pillars of Islam. These are the pillars, not the complete structure, but if the pillar is strong, inshallah the structure will also be strong. Allah says in the Quran in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 56, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَىٰ إِلَّا لِيَعْبُدُونَ That we have created the jinn and the men not but to worship me. Ibadah comes from the word abd, which means a slave that we human beings have been created besides the jinn to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you obey the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, if you abstain from the food which Allah has asked you to abstain, for example, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal lazina amanu, O you believe, innam al khamru wal maifuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, well, anzab wal azlamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rushim minam li shaitan, these are safe in handiwork, fast anibu lalukum tuflihun, abstain from this handiwork that may prosper. So we have been advised that we should abstain from alcohol, from gambling, from idol worship, from dedication of stones, from divination of arrows. Abstaining from alcohol is even advised in the Bible. For the Jews as well as the Christians, it's mentioned, in the book of Proverbs, chapter number 20, verse number 1, that wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, whoever has it is deceived. It's mentioned in the book of Ephesians, chapter number 5, verse number 18, that be not drunk with wine. So if you abstain from drinking alcohol, you are following the teaching of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet, and you are submitting your will, you are doing ibadah. Allah says in the Quran, in no less than four different places, in Surah Baqarah chapter number 2, verse number 173, in Surah Maida chapter number 5, verse number 3, in Surah Anam chapter number 6, verse number 145, and Surah Nahal chapter number 16, verse number 115, Hurrimat alaykubul maitu tu waddamu wa rahmi kinzeed, wa ma uhilla li gairi labi, forbidden for you for food are dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah's name is invoked. These four foods have been prohibited for the Muslims in the Quran. These four types of food are even prohibited in the Bible. The Bible mentions in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 5, and the book of Deuteronomy, 
chapter number 14, verse number 21, that you shall not eat that which dies of itself. So dead meat is prohibited even for the Jews and the Christians. And drinking blood, having blood has been prohibited in the Bible in no less than five different places. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, verse number 4. In the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 14. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 12, verse number 16. In 1 Samuel, chapter number 14, verse number 33. As well as the book of Acts, chapter, chapter number 15, verse number 29. It says, it advises that having blood is prohibited. The Bible says in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8, that the swine, though it has hooved feet and it's cloven-footed, it chews not the cud. It's unclean for you. You shall not touch its carcass nor eat its meat. It's unclean for you. The same message is repeated in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8, that the swine, the pig, though it had cloven footed, it's cloven footed, it chews not the cud. Thou shall not eat its flesh, nor touch its carcass. It's unclean for you. And eating of pig is also prohibited in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5. So no less than three places, eating of pork, the flesh of swine, is prohibited. The hikmah behind it, you can refer to my cassette, Misconception about Islam. I've given the hikmah, why pork is prohibited. Regarding eating any food on which any name besides Allah's name is invoked, is mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29, as well as the book of Revelation, chapter number 2, verse number 14, that you shall not have the meat or anything else which is put on the idols. In the conclusion of my talk, I'd just like to mention a couple of more similarities. There are several, time doesn't permit us to go into the details. I'll just touch on the modesty. The hijab that is mentioned, as I mentioned in my answer yesterday, that Allah first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman. Allah says in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, verse number 30, that say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty. Whenever a man looks at a woman, any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. The same message was given by Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. It's mentioned in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 5, verse number 27 and 28. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, says, that it was told of the old times that thou shall not commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, said that previously the law was not to commit adultery. But I say unto you, whosoever looketh upon a woman to lust after her has already committed adultery in his heart. Regarding the hijab for the woman, Allah gives the guidance in Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 31, as well as Surah Azab, chapter 33, verse number 59. If you refer to the Quran and say Hadith, there are basically six criteria for hijab. The first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman. For the man, it's from the navel to the knee. For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hands up to the wrist. Certain scholars say this should be covered. The remaining, four, the remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is, the clothes should not be transparent. The third is, it should not be tight-fitting so that it reveals the figure. Fourth, it should not be glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not resemble that of the unbeliever. These criteria are even given in the Bible. If you read the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 22, verse number 5, it says, The woman will not wear clothes that which pertinent to a man. Neither shall a man wear clothes that which is of a woman. All those who do that are an abomination to the Lord. It's mentioned in the first Timothy, chapter number two, verse number nine. It says that the woman should be dressed up with modesty, with shamefacedness and sobriety. They should not wear braided hair of gold or pearl or costly array. And you see the photograph of Mother Mary, she's like a Muslim, huh? And it's said in the first Corinthians chapter number 11, verse number 5 to 6, that a woman when she prays, if she uncovers the head, she dishonors the head, a head should be shaved off. Head should be shaved off. And if 
following the teachings of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, makes a person a Christian, I would like to say that we Muslims are more Christian than the Christians themselves. There are many other similarities like circumcision, etc. Time doesn't permit me. I would like to end my talk by mentioning that the word Christianity doesn't exist anywhere in the Bible. However, the word Christian is there in the book of Acts. It was a nickname given by the people of Antioch to the followers of Jesus Christ, peace be upon him. Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, never referred to himself as a Christian. He never heard that name when he lived. Therefore, I say that Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, he was a Muslim, as it's mentioned in the Gospel of, of John, chapter 5, verse number 30. I can of my own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. For I seek not my will, but the will of my Father. Anyone who says, I seek not my will, but the will of Almighty God, he's a Muslim. So Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, was a Muslim. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 82, the closest to the Muslims are those who say, we are Christians. Wa'akhir da'wana, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. The first question is, since the books, since the sacred books of different religions such as Hinduism talk about the prophecy of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, does that mean that those books were revealed by Allah to people before us? And if not, where did those books come from? And the second related question is, how would you explain the fact that polytheist religions such as Hinduism and Buddhism predicted predicted or have references to of the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. So let Dr. Zakir address that. Alhamdulillah. Wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Amma abad. Auzu billahi minash shaitan ar-rajim. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Udu ila sabili rabbika bil hikma wal mu'azzi bil hasna wa jadir bil lati hasan. Rabbi shahli sadri wa yassirli amri. My respected elders and my dear brothers and sisters, I welcome all of you with the Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm thankful to the organizers for allowing me to have a half an hour question answer session. I personally prefer the question answer session than the talk because it's a dialogue rather than a monologue. And usually I prefer question answer session live on the microphone. Normally when we ask for chips, we get hundreds of them. And when a few are selected, people always, they complain that why has not my question been asked. I prefer the question and answer session life because it's more challenging. And it's more challenging for me and it gives me food for thought. Therefore, I prefer the question and answer session more than the talk. So I'm thankful to the organizers to give half an hour question and answer session to me. The first question asked by the brother, is that if the prophecies of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is mentioned in the Buddhist and the Hindu scriptures, can we conclude that these are the words, the revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? The reply to this question is, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Rad, chapter number 13, verse number 38, and in every age have we sent a revelation. In every age have we sent a book. By name, only four are mentioned in the Quran. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil, and the Quran. But there are several other books revealed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For example, Suhuf Ibrahim, etc. Whether can we consider the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Puranas, the Bhagavad Gita, the Dhammapad, the, all the other scriptures which I quoted yesterday in my talk, to be the revelation from Almighty God. Since these books are not mentioned by name in the glorious Quran or the Sahih Hadith, we cannot say for sure that they are the revelation of Almighty God. What we can say, maybe they are, but we cannot say for sure that they are books of Almighty God. What we can say is maybe they are revelation of Almighty God. But even if they were revelation of Almighty God, all the books that were revealed before the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, they were meant 
only for those people and the complete message was supposed to be followed for a particular time period. So irrespective whether these books may have been the word of God, today all the human beings in the world, whether they live in Canada, in USA, in India, in Pakistan, in Saudi Arabia, in Japan, they have to follow the last and final revelation, the glorious Quran, and follow the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. The reason I quoted these scriptures is based on the verse of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 64, which says, Ta'alo ila kalmatin sawa imbarna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Which is the first term? Allah, not with the illallah. That we worship none but Allah. So based on this verse of the glorious Quran, which I consider to be the master key for da'wah, which says, come to common terms as between us and you. So based on this verse, I quoted the other religious scriptures. Since the followers of that scripture believe it to be the word of God, I say, then at least why don't you follow your scripture? And your scripture mentions about Tawheed, about the oneness of God, which, have, which I have discussed in other lectures. It also speaks about the last and final messenger, thus calling them to the Deen al-Haqq, that is Islam. Hope that answers the question. The next question is not really related to the topic that he spoke about. The question is, how do you develop such a good memory? The success to the memory and my talk is, number one, it's Allah's help. Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number three, verse number 160, if Allah helps you, None can overcome you. If Allah forsakes you, who is there then who can help you? So let the believers put their trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So number one is Allah's help. Number two, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah an kabut chapter number 29, verse number 69. If you strive, if you do jihad, if you strive and struggle in the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will open up your pathways. So second is striving and struggling. And the third is the technique. Allah says in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse number 43. And Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 7. It says that if you don't have knowledge, ask the person who is knowledgeable. Ask the person who is expert in this field. So third comes technique, and in Bombay, where I come from, we have training sessions, how we train people in the field of Dawa. We have a training course of approximately 35 to 40 days. We have once a year, where hundreds of applications come and we train them. And mashallah, if you hear the speakers of Bombay from our organization, we have more than 15 full-time speakers amongst the gents and 10 amongst the ladies. Mashallah, almost all of them code. Some of them code better than me. So the last is technique which we train them. For those who can't come to Bombay, you can go to our website irf.net where there's a Dawa training program which may give you 5 or 10% of the gist of the training program we have in Bombay. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> MashaAllah. The next question is, who are we to judge that Islam is the proper religion? Everyone has their own beliefs and think that their God is the, the right God and the true God. Who are we to say that they are all wrong and Islam is the true religion? As far as the question is concerned, that everyone says that their God is the best God. And second is how can you prove that Islam is the best way of life? As far as the first part of the question is concerned, I've given the talk on concept of God in the major world religions, speaking about God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, mentioned in the Jewish scriptures, in the Christian scriptures, in the Buddhist scriptures, in the Parsi scriptures, in the Sikh scriptures, in the Hindu scriptures, and all of these scriptures, they speak about monotheism, about Tawheed. How I spoke yesterday about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa there's also a talk on concept of God in the major world religions, and from this scripture we can prove that all the major scriptures say that we should worship only one almighty God who has got no images, who has got no idols. Based again on the same verse of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 64 which says, 
ta'ala ila kalmatin sawa in bayna bainakum come to common terms as in us and you which is the first term allah na buda illallah that we worship none but one almighty god the second part of the question is how can we prove that islam is the right way of life is the best way of life if we analyze most of the major religions they speak good things most of the major religions they tell us not to rob not to cheat not to molest a woman but the difference between islam and the other religions is that islam shows you a way how to achieve a state of that goodness for example all the religions say that you should not rob hinduism says that christianity says that judaism says that islam says the same but islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people will not rob islam has a system of zakat that is every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level more than 85 grams of gold he or she should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity every lunar year if every rich human being gives zakat poverty will be eradicated from this world there will not be a single human being who will die of hunger and according to statistics we come to know that the income of the three richest people in the world is equal to the gdp of the 47 poorest country in the world and there are another statistics that if a few hundred richest people in the world if they give zakat 2.5% of the wealth in charity poverty will be eradicated from this world after this the glorious quran says in surah maida chapter number 5 verse number 38 as to the thief beat a man or a woman chop off his or her hand as a punishment from allah subhanahu wa taala non muslim will say chopping off the hands in this age of science and technology islam is a barbaric religion it's a ruthless way of life and they think that if you go to saudi arabia where this law is practiced every second person you come across will have his hands chopped off i have been to saudi arabia several times i have not seen a single human being whose hands have been chopped off there may be a few people whose hands have been chopped off but it is not as common as they think it is but do you know today people look up to usa america as one of the most advanced country in the world do you know it has one of the highest rate of robbery and theft in the world i am asking a simple question that if you implement the islamic sharia in usa or in north america that every rich man who has a saving of more than 85 grams of gold should give 2.5% of that excess wealth in charity that is zakat and after that if any person robs chop of his or her hand as a punishment i am asking a question will the rate of robbery and theft will it increase will it remain the same or will it decrease but naturally it will decrease it's a practical law you implement the sharia and you get results that's the reason the least rate of robbery and theft in the world in any country it's in saudi arabia similarly most of the major religions say that you should not molest a woman that you should not rape a woman hinduism says that christianity says that judaism says that islam says the same but islam shows you a way how to achieve a state in which people no man will molest or rape any woman islam has a system of hijab normally people speak about the hijab for the woman but allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the glorious quran first speaks about the hijab for the man and then for the woman allah says in the quran in surah nur chapter number 24 verse number 30 say to the believing man that he should lower his gaze and guard his modesty that whenever any brazen thought comes in your mind whenever anyone looks at a woman the man he should lower his gaze after that the quran speaks about the hijab for the woman in surah nur chapter 24 verse number 31 allah says say to the believing woman that she should lower her gaze and guard her modesty and display not her beauty except what appears ordinary of and draw her veil a head covering over the bosom and display not her beauty except in front of her husband her son her father and a big list of mahram the close relatives which she can't marry is given there are basically six criteria for hijab given in the quran and the sahih hadith the first is the extent which differs between the man and the woman for the man it's from the navel to the knee 
For the woman, the complete body should be covered. The only part that can be seen are the face and the hand is up to the wrist. The remaining five criteria are the same for the man and the woman. The second is the clothes they wear, it should not be tight so that it reveals the figure. Third, it should not be transparent. Fourth, it should not be so glamorous so that it attracts the opposite sex. Fifth, it should not resemble that of the opposite sex. And sixth, it should not be a sign of the unbeliever. And the reason for hijab is given in Surah Ahzab, chapter 33, verse number 59, where Allah says, O Prophet, tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women that when they go abroad, they should put on the cloak so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. Quran says, hijab has been prescribed for the women so that they shall be recognized and it will prevent them from being molested. For example, if there are two twin sisters who are very beautiful or equally beautiful and if they are walking down the streets of Toronto, maybe young street, and if one twin sister sees in the Islamic hijab, the complete body cover except the face and the hands up to the wrist, and the other twin sister, she is wearing the western clothes, the mini skirts are short. And if round the corner there is a hooligan, there is a ruffian who is waiting for a catch, who is waiting to tease a girl, which girl will he tease? Will he tease the girl wearing the Islamic hijab or will he tease the girl wearing the mini skirts or short? After that, the Islamic Sharia says, if any man rapes any woman, he gets capital punishment, death penalty. People say, death penalty? In this age of science and technology, Islam is a barbaric religion. It's a ruthless way of life. But when I ask this question to thousands of non-Muslims, that God forbid, if someone rapes your mother, rapes your sister, and if you are made the judge, and if the rapist is born in front of you, what punishment will you give him? And all of them, 100% said, we will put him to death. Some went to the extent of saying, we will torture him to death. So why these double standards? Someone rapes your mother, your sister, you want to put him to death. Somebody rapes somebody else's mother or sister, you say death penalty is a barbaric law. Do you know, according to statistics, USA, which happens to be one of the most advanced countries in the world, do you know it has one of the highest rate of rape in the world? According to the FBI statistics, in 1990 alone, on average, every day, 1,756 rapes took place every day in the year 1990. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, in the year 1996, on average, every day, 2,713 cases of rape took place. In the year 1990, 1,756. In the year 1996, 2,713. Maybe the Americans got more bold. That means every 32 seconds, one rape is taking place in USA. You know, we are here in this auditorium, maybe for the past six hours. Already 600 rapes may have taken place in USA till the time you are here. I am asking the question that if you implement the Islamic Sharia in USA, that if any man looks at a woman, any brazen thought, any unashamed thought comes in his mind, he should lower his gaze. After that, every woman should be properly covered, complete body, except the face and the hands up to the wrist. After that, any man rapes a woman, capital punishment. I am asking the question, will the rate of rape in America, in USA, will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? Will it increase? Will it remain the same or will it decrease? It will decrease. It's a practical law. You implement the Sharia and you get results. That's the reason I say Islam, besides speaking good things, it shows you a way how to achieve the state of goodness. Therefore, I say that Islam is the best way of life. And Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the dina in the lahil Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah is Islam. Takbir. Okay, unfortunately, we're running short on time, so we only have time for a few more questions. Uh, the next question is, what argumentation would you use to do da'wah to an atheist and or to a Christian or a Jew? And how would you introduce the topic to them? As far as doing da'wah to Christians and Jews, inshallah, I'll be giving a talk on similarities 
between Islam and Christianity, which you can hear tomorrow. As far as the first part of the question is concerned, how to do dawah to an atheist? If you remember, I said earlier, the masterpiece, Sulaiman Imran, chapter 3, verse 64, which says, Ta'alu ila kalmitin sawa imbayna baynakum. Come to common terms as between us and you. Now one may ask, what is the common term between the atheist? What common term can a Muslim have with an atheist? But yet, I call this the master key. The first thing I do when I meet an atheist is, I congratulate him. I congratulate him because he says he does not believe in God. The reason I congratulate him is, all the other human beings, most of them, they are blindly following the parents. The Christian, he is a Christian because father is a Christian. The person is a Hindu because father is a Hindu. Most of the Muslims are Muslims because their father is a Muslim. This atheist is thinking. His father, his parents may be religious, but he does not believe in the gods which his parents worship. The reason I congratulate him is because he has said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, Islamic creed, La ilaha, there is no God. The only thing I have to do is illa Allah, but Allah, which I shall do inshallah. Half my job is done. To the other non-Muslim, first I have to prove to him that the God he's worshipping is the wrong God, is a false God, and then prove to him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Here, half my job is done. He has already said the first part of the Islamic Shahada, La ilaha. So my job, half my job is done. I have to only prove illa Allah, which I shall do inshallah. Most of the atheists we realize have become atheists because they believe in science and technology. These people think that science has advanced so much, we don't require any scripture, we don't require any religion, etc. The first question I ask to the atheist is, that suppose there is an equipment, there is a machinery, which no one in the world has ever seen before. If it's brought in front of you, if it's brought in front of the atheist, and if we ask the question to him, that who will be the first person who will be able to tell you the mechanism of this machinery or this object, what can be his reply? What can he reply? Suppose a machinery who no one in the world has seen, if it's bought in front of the atheist and he's asked the question, who will be the first person who will tell you the mechanism of this machinery or object? The reply the atheist will give you is the first person who will tell you the mechanism is the manufacturer. Some may say the creator, some may say the inventor, some may say the producer. Whatever they say, it will be somewhat similar. Either they say the creator, the manufacturer, the producer, the inventor, it will be somewhat similar. Just keep it at the back of your mind. Then ask them the next question. That how did our universe come into existence? So the atheist will tell us that initially there was a primary nebula. Then there was a big bang. There was a secondary separation which gave rise to galaxies, the sun, the moon, and the earth on which we live. This we call as a Big Bang. When did you come to know about this creation of the universe? So he will tell you, about 30-40 years back, the scientists that discovered this. You ask him the question, but what you are talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran, in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 30, which says, Avalam kafuru. Do not the unbelievers see. Anna samawati wal arda. Ka that the heavens and the earth were joined together and we clove them asunder. What you are talking about the Big Bang is already mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago. Who could have mentioned that? So the atheist will say, maybe it's a fluke. No problem. Don't argue with him. You continue. The light of the moon, is it its own light? or reflected light. So the atheist will tell us that previously we thought the moon has its own light. Recently we have come to know in science, recently means 100 years back, 200 years back, we have come to know that the light of the moon is not its own light but a reflected light. The Quran mentions 1400 years ago in Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse number 61, that blessed is he who had placed the constellation in the sky and placed therein a lamp, a sun, having its own light and moon having reflected light or borrowed light. 
The Arabic word used for moonlight in the Quran is munir or nur, meaning reflected light or borrowed light. Who could have mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago that the light of the moon is not its own light but reflected light which we have come to recently? The atheist may say, your prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, maybe he was an intelligent man. Don't argue with him. Continue. The world that we live on, what's the shape of this earth on which we live? The atheist will tell you, it is spherical. When did we come to know? So he will tell us, 19, it was 1597 when Sir Francis Drake, when he sailed around the earth, that he proved that the earth was spherical. But the Quran says 1400 years ago, in Surah Naziyat, chapter 79, verse number 30, and thereafter, we have made the earth X-shaped. The Arabic word dahaha, one of its meaning is the earth is an expanse. The other meaning is derived from the Arabic word dhuya, which means an egg. And it doesn't refer to a normal egg. It refers to the egg of an ostrich. And we know the world is not completely round like a ball, but it is geospherical in shape. It is starting from the pole. And if you analyze the shape of the egg of an ostrich, that too is geospherical in shape. Who could have mentioned 400 years ago that the shape of the earth is geospherical? Again, the atheist may say, you know, your prophet, maybe he was super intelligent. Don't argue with him. You can continue. When I was in school, I had learned that the sun was stationary. It revolved, but did not rotate about its own axis. So the atheist will say, is that mentioned in the Quran? I say, no, that is what I learned in school. And I passed my school in 1982 approximately 12 years back, I had learned the sun was stationary, did not rotate about its own axis. But the Quran says in Surah Ambiya, chapter number 21, verse number 33, It is Allah who has created the night and the day, the sun and the moon, each one traveling in orbit with its own motion. So the Quran says that besides the sun revolving, it even rotates about its own axis. Who could have mentioned this in the Quran 1400 years ago? And the atheist will be silent. There will be a long pause. Don't wait for the reply. You can keep on continuing. Today, science tells us that the universe is expanding, which is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Dhariyat, chapter number 51, verse number 47. The Quran speaks about the watch cycle which we learned in school. It was Sir Bernard Palissy in 1580 who first described the water cycle, how the water evaporates from the ocean, forms into clouds, moves into the interior, falls down as rain. This water cycle is spoken about in great detail in the Quran in several verses. In Surah Az-Zumur, chapter 39, verse 21. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 24. In Surah Hijr, chapter 15, verse 22. In Surah Mu'minun, chapter number 23, verse number 18. In Surah Nur, chapter number 24, verse number 43. In Surah Rum, chapter number 30, verse 48. In Surah Araf, chapter number 7, verse number 17. In Surah Furqan, chapter number 25, verse 40 to 49. In Surah Fatir, chapter number 35, verse number 9. In Surah Yasin, chapter number 36, verse number 34. In Surah Mul, chapter number 67, verse number 30. In Surah Tarek, chapter number 86, verse number 11. There are hundreds of verses in the Quran which only speak about the word cycle which science has discovered recently. We can keep on to talking that today we have come to know that the plants have got sex which we did not know earlier. Quran says in Surah Taha, chapter number 20, verse number 53, that the plants have got sexes, male and female. Today, we have come to know that there are two types of water, sweet and salty. And there is a barrier between them, which is mentioned in the Quran in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 53, and Surah Rahman, chapter 55, verse 17 and 18. It is Allah who has let free two bodies of flowing water. Though they meet, they will not mix. There is a barrier between them. Today, science tells us that it is the mountains which prevent the earth from shaking, which is mentioned in the Quran 1400 years ago in Surah Naba, chapter number 78, verse number 6 and 7. The Quran speaks about biology, that we have created every living creature from water, every living thing in Surah Ambiya, chapter 21. Verse number 30, Quran mentioned this 1400 years ago. The Quran speaks about zoology, about the lifestyle of the spider in Surah Ankabut, chapter 29, verse 41. About the ant in Surah Namal, chapter 27, verse 17 to 18. About the bee in Surah Nahal, chapter number 16, verse 68, 69. 
the Quran speaks about embryology. In Surah Alaq, chapter 96, verse number 1 and 2, we have created the human being from alaqa, a leech-like substance, which we have come to recently. The Quran speaks about the embryological stages in Surah Mu'minun, chapter 23, verse number 12 to 14. You can go on talking about the scientific points. There are more than a thousand verses in the Quran which speak about science. After every scientific fact, you ask the question, who could have mentioned that in the Quran? The only reply the atheist can give you is the creator, the, the cherisher, the manufacturer, the inventor, the producer. This creator, this manufacturer, this producer, this inventor, we Muslims call him as Allah. That's the reason Francis Bacon, a very famous philosopher, said, little knowledge of science takes you away from Almighty God. In-depth knowledge of science makes you a believer in God. That's the reason today scientists are not eliminating God, they're eliminating models of God. La ilaha illallah. Hope that answers the question. Okay, uh, unfortunately, we have gone over our time for this session. I know all of you must be enjoying it as much as I am. So uh, this session is now closed. Um, I'll pass it on to the next uh, MC to take over, inshallah.